The Close Weekly brings you the most actionable advice for today's real estate market. We'll unpack what you need to know to move the needle in your business in a real way. This podcast is brought to you by Premier Real Estate Agent Training Program, The Close Pro. Go to theclose.com slash podcast to learn more and to get $25 off. Now, here's your host, the man who has been a top producing agent for over 25 years, Sean Modry. Hello, Close Weekly. It's Sean Modry, and we're back for another episode. And today we have one of our contributors from the Close himself, Chris Lenzel. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Sean. Glad to be here with you guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome, man. Welcome. It's so good. I'm, I miss our conversations. You and I get to used to chat all the time, and we're so busy right now. Well, you're super busy, right? You're right. I, I spent a lot of time uh, towards the end of 2021 um, going to some major real estate events, and I got to tell you, my first, my, the first thing I just got to say out there uh, is events are back, man. I mean, it is it is something that we uh, as as an industry. Um, necessarily translated to virtual for a while, but man, people are excited to be back in it. Um, and I've got kind of a unique perspective here because I both attended events as an attendee and as somebody who's there to cover the event and write some content and make some videos for the close. I also attended uh, events as uh, as a featured speaker. So I've got kind of both uh, both sides of the coin there. Um, so w- where do you want to start? Where, where should we dig in on this? Well, let's, let's start with the, the first event, um, that you went to, um, I can't remember which one that was. What was your first event? So that would have been the Inman connect conference. Uh, it was in Las Vegas. It was towards the end of October, 2021. And, uh, I was there as an attendee, as well as someone who is covering the event, uh, writing some articles, um, creating some video content about it. And a couple of things that I took away from this event that I think we're going to see rolling forward into 2021, or excuse me, 2022 as well. Uh, first, people are obviously they're excited to get back into in person events, but they're also bringing that excitement to decision making in their business. There's definitely um, a reemergence, a new kind of um, committed. Uh, committed motivation on the part of a lot of real estate agents to improve and better their business. And the reason I think that it's, this is a little different than it was before is when I was walking the expo floor of an event, like the Inman connect conference, I'd hear a lot of top level, you know, kind of like introductory conversations going on around me. I'm always listening to what people are talking about. This is historically what I hear at these events. At Inman Connect in October of 2021, I heard a lot of closer conversations. Hmm. People weren't just listening to the pitches and and being thoughtful about their options. People were putting their names on the dotted line. And this is a trend I'm seeing across the industry right now. We are, as an industry, making more decisions and people are committing to some of these decisions right now um, as strategies they want to work through in 2022. You mean they're signing up for some of these products, some of the new technologies that are out there. Is that what you mean by committing? Yeah. Signing up for products, signing up for strategies, committing to the committing to giving new, new strategies a try. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I say frequently to folks that you have a lot of business strategy, operational options in the real estate industry. Mm-hmm. There's there's more technology products out there than you can shake a stick at. There's more lead generation strategies than you'll ever have a chance to try completely. So this means that you've got options for what the best way to run your business is. And there are people who are shopping right now. We've got high performers in our industry right now that are shopping these different options right now. People are not satisfied with the status quo. We're definitely seeing folks mixing it up right now. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper into that because I completely agree. What I see is a lot of the technologies that were top of the line just a few years ago um, are falling aside to some newer technologies that are coming out. And I, I got to say, like every day, I feel like I see some new name or it's kind of a name, like some kind of letters put together to make some kind of a sound that sounds like a name <laughs> pop up in the real estate industry. And so I'm super curious. So from your 
from the MN Connect, what were maybe the the top um, picks technology wise that you think are going to be game changers in 2022? Mm, that's a great question. So, um, you know, Inman Connect from from a technology perspective was very interesting because this particular conference focused a lot on real estate agents and their place in the um, financial journey of their clients. And so some big takeaways as far as those tools from this particular event were tool were companies like um, Homeward or Knock or any of these other companies that are blurring the lines between where the real estate services stop and the financial and mortgage services begin. Mm. This line, you know, the, my big takeaway from this particular event was that line isn't a line anymore. It is a blurry grayscale. And we are seeing a, a transition from the services that real estate agents are providing and the services that mortgage professionals or financial professionals are providing. And then we're seeing a lot of overlap here. And man, this was on display front and center at the Inman Connect conference in October in Las Vegas. And um, I'm expecting to see even more of it in 2022. 2022 is going to be the year, I believe, where we're going to see um, a real, uh, the overlap, it, it's, it's no longer going to be the edge of the Venn diagram. The financial services and the real estate services sectors are going to be sitting on top of each other pretty soon. And it'll be up to us to kind of sort through that intermingling and figure out how we can best serve our clients. Yeah, you know, I think the argument that you hear over and over about that is, you know, the regulations that don't want to allow the blending of real estate with mortgage, with title, with hazard insurance, and those kind of things. But remember, there was a time where it was actually illegal. I, I don't know if you, you're going to believe this. It was actually illegal, Chris, for you to pick up a stranger in your car and charge them money to drive them across town. And today, it. it's commonplace. <laughs> we put our kids in the back of strangers' cars and drive them across town now. Right. Remember, there was a time where you didn't talk to strangers. Now you call them to have them give you a ride in the middle of Las Vegas. Incredible. Incredible. So so I think about technologies like that because, you know, when though when 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 um, those technologies came out, it was it was actually illegal to to provide ride share services or because the taxi industries had such a grasp on the legal um, aspects of things. And because customers demanded it is what made the change, is what mm -hmm. made um, things like Uber and Lyft um, a reality. And so consumer driving the demand for this might push it through. So to yeah. be specific, like services like Homeward, which, you know, Tim Hale's company Homeward is interesting because it's doesn't seem like a mortgage company, but essentially it's a mortgage company. Yeah, yeah. There, this this idea, this reclassification of what these financial services companies actually are. Mm -hmm. Are you a mortgage company? Are you a? I, I, there's not even a word off the top of my head for it. Like, are you a, a short term uh, loan based on existing equity in order to make a new purchase, uh, a cash purchase, like a classified cash purchase? Like, we don't have the vernacular to even describe this just yet. Right. Um, which is making it a very interesting thing. But I, you know, Sean, you hit on something that I think is really interesting here in your Uber example is it being that the, those changes in that ride, the, like the ride hailing economy were driven by consumer demand of a product they didn't even really know existed yet. They just mm -hmm. knew that the status quo didn't satisfy their needs. And a lot of these changes, especially in the financial aspect of the real estate industry are also happening via this they just know people know they're like i don't i don't know what i want but i know that the current process sucks my will to live so what yeah. else can we do here and this was really on display in the uh, in the in the uh, uh conversations a lot of the main stage conversations the one thing though that i will caution people about is you know, one of the takeaways, and you can actually find this, I've got an article on the close.com. Uh, it's a wrap up of this Inman uh, conference. One of the things that I took away from a lot of these conversations was, unfortunately, a lot of the professional conversations we're having right now 
are talking about how this will benefit agents, how this will benefit our volume, how this will benefit our GCI and our bottom line. And though all of those things are important, it is a lot of the, it felt like a lot of the third, fourth, 10th priorities in this conversation were our actual consumers, hmm. which is going to wind up being a problem because if we're driving change based on the operator's uh, you know, best interest, that change is going to be temporary. And honestly, it's going to find some backlash once our consumers realize, hey, this isn't in my best interest. This is in your best interest. And well, it's just not going to stick. Well, to take that back, that's like Uber, you know, 20 years ago, going to the taxi industry and saying, hey, we're going to create an app to make it easier for consumers to contact you. Yeah. Instead of going direct to consumer. Now, yeah. I read your article. And I thought it was outstanding, by the way. And Thanks. the one thing that really stood out to me was the conversation about commission elimination due yeah. to some of these services. Yeah. Do you want to explain that a little bit? Because that that's a threat to our industry, to, to I shouldn't say to our industry, to some, some agents, businesses. Yeah. Um, that can be a, a, a very vital threat. Yeah, so I, I, I'm really glad you bring that up. Actually, I was just thinking about this. I'm just going to start off by calling out um, Clelia Warburg Peters, um, Miss Warburg Peters. If you're listening to this, I am your biggest fan, and I would like to buy you a cup of coffee and just tell you about it one day. Um, uh, Miss uh, Warburg Peters is uh, she's an Inman editor at large. Uh, she has um, she facilitated a conversation at uh, Inman Connect. Um, around the transaction of the future. And she's got a lot of street cred when it comes to this sort of thing because um, she's a founder of, um, or, or an operator of one of the most recognizable indie brokerages in the space. She's a founding member of, eventual, of a venture uh, capital firm. She knows what she's talking about here. And one of the things she brought to uh, focus in this conversation was this idea that real estate commissions could eventually become loss leaders for other services. And if you're not familiar with this concept, think about Best Buy and their $2 DVDs at the front of the store. Best Buy's not making any money on these DVDs. In fact, they're probably losing money on these DVDs, but they're selling them two bucks at the front of the store. They're advertising them in all their newspapers and their website to get you to come in. So you will also look at refrigerators and washing machines and televisions and home stereos where they actually make their money. Mm. And this idea that a no commission model could be a component of moving towards, hey, come, come do your real estate slash financial transaction with us. You'll get the commission for free, but we're going to charge you on the, on the other end of things. To think that that isn't uh, something that that big firms are bandying about their their boardroom tables that would be unrealistic. These conversations are happening right now. Personally, I don't think we're going to see that in 2022, but you never know at this point. Firms are moving quickly. Well, you know, honestly, Chris, it's been happening for years because anybody who's worked with home builders, where the home builder says, "Hey, if if you buy this house, we have an agent we'll refer you to that will list and sell your house at a discount." I mean, I, I worked the builder business for many years. That was their lots leader, drew their customers in and made them a benefit for them buying their home over somebody else's house. And the builder would pay, you know, a, a, a fair commission to us to, to support mm -hmm. them and, and doing those discounted commissions. So yeah. I, I think it's a very similar business model. Yeah, I, I agree. There's, there's definitely a component to this conversation whenever we have a an ecosystem of uh, like an industry ecosystem where are there are multiple um, kind of points of conversion, you know, whether it's a commission on a, on a, uh, for a real estate agent or a commission on an, on a, um, uh, a mortgage or an appraisal or an inspection or a whatever, like we have multiple mm -hmm. conversion points along that pipeline here. We're going to see some kind of bending and flexing and, and ebbing and flowing as far as who's charging what, what's a loss leader, what's a what's um the profit center. You know, I personally the financial end of this uh, of the real disruption happening in the real estate industry, I find very interesting right now. Um, I think we are definitely gonna see some movement in in that end of things. Um but I think that movement actually might be small relative to some of the other movements that we'll see mm -hmm. in 2022. 
like what that was a great lead that was well, a great thank lead. you thank you <laughs> i'm gonna be honest with you this isn't my first rodeo here but man i love talking to you about this sort of thing so thank you so much for having you me you and i could go on and out we really could like about really you and could. i is, is we're not haters of any business model you know i've had lots yeah. of conversations about this stuff yeah. and you know and you know you see different business models that are coming in to try to disrupt either even a small business on a local level to a major you know, billion dollar funded hedge fund company coming in. Um, and you and I are just nerds about yeah. business models and, yeah, and totally. yes, they're going to disrupt, but yeah. I don't think either one of, I don't think you or I either way believe it's going to eliminate every real estate agent. Yeah. I, th I think that that's, that's crazy. Yeah. We really yeah. could in the first 11 hour podcast in history, that, that would be us talking about this. Um, but you know, to to that point, there's a couple of places that I think we're going to see some disruption in 2022. Um, the first is going to be um, a shifted focus away from lead generation and towards lead conversion. Um, you know, ultimately, lead conversion is a topic that is. It feels like it is the. Uh, it's it's what gets brought up after you get sold a lead generation product. Um, and it doesn't get the due course it needs. And the reason why I think we're going to start to see a shift towards lead conversion versus lead generation is uh, Redfin recently released uh, some stats uh, about um, uh, conversion, lead conversion, and the overall volume of lead generation online. And in the last five to six years, we've seen upwards of six times as many leads being generated today as were being generated five or six years ago. I mean, not a small increase, a 6x increase, but we're only seeing marginally a few more transactions converting every year. Like the number, the amount of turnover has not risen anywhere close to that 6x of generation, which shows us two things. One, it shows us we're not nurturing our leads properly, that we're grabbing these leads at the top of the funnel. They are not making it to the bottom of the funnel. Mm -hmm. We're also, this also indicates that we're grabbing these leads, maybe these leads that have a, a, a separation between intent and execution. Like I'm interested in learning more information with no real plan to ever do anything mm -hmm. once I learn that information. Uh, and a novice, um, quite frankly, mediocre real estate agent, if this describes you, sorry, guys, I'm just telling it like it is a novice, mediocre real estate agent takes these undeveloped, um, unconverted leads and just tosses them out. They're like, these, these aren't for me. This, this is, this is a waste of my time. Guess what? That's just not true. The, the tail on these leads is just longer. You need to get to the other end of the tail. And so I think my gut tells me we're going to start to see an emphasis shift away from get those leads, convert more people, get more people in the top of your funnel, to, uh, a shift from that to, okay, you've got literally 700 people in your CRM. What are you going to do about it now? Yeah. And, that, and I'll add to that because, um, so the long tail in advertising is what Chris is referring to here. If you guys aren't nerdy nerds like us. So, <laughs> so, so the long tail in advertising means, you know, you put out your initial, um, marketing pieces, it generates a certain number of leads, yeah. but the long tail is those straggling leads that come in from that initial advertising and through follow-up, you get those. I would almost add though, there's a front tail. Mm. Then the front tail is the fact that now we can identify leads so early in the process. And that's one of the biggest mistakes is you might find out that, you know, Mrs. Home Seller is interested in moving before she's ever thought of having a conversation with her, her family about it. Yeah. Right. Because she, it's, it's that like that story of um, Target, right. Who mailed the coupons for, for prenatal vitamins yeah. to the daughter to a 14 year old daughter of a man and uh, or mailed her di diapers and that kind of stuff. And, and he called Target and was upset and Target said, well, our algorithm says she's, you know, likely pregnant. And he said, well, how? And he said, because she bought these vitamins and mm -hmm. people who buy this type of vitamins are tr traditionally pregnant, you know, and, and going to have a baby. And it turned out she was. Now, I don't know if that story is anecdotal or true, but it definitely proves the point that we're just able through technology to identify a lot of people a lot earlier. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're 100 right, and actually, you kind of lead into my uh, again. It's like we've done this before. You yeah. perfectly lead into the next prediction here, which is um, uh, for me, uh, what you're talking about there. The target antidote is a is a great example of this. Um, the lead generation that we will continue to do, there's going to be much more of a focus in the field uh, of lead generation specific to predictive analytics, where we're using these massive data sets um, mm -hmm. to make smarter decisions about who we are marketing to at the top of the funnel um, in order to create better conversations and better um, better conversion rates. Um, and you know, if you're not familiar with the predictive analytics um, approach, it essentially is this idea that you're going to take all of these massive data sets and think about all the different companies that are, they, they say they're one thing, but they're just masquerading because they're data companies. Think about all of the social media networks that happen to be free that you're using. These companies aren't free because they just have a place in their heart uh, to provide a free service. You are the product. As you mm -hmm. use these, these services, you and your data are the product that they turn around and sell. So think about all the social media networks. Think about Google. Think about uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, TikTok is a great example. <laughs> think about all the data that your credit card companies that uh, have on you, that all of the stores like uh, Target and, and Macy's and, and all the places that have you know these in-store reward programs that they have on you. And then I want you to take all that data, these literally hundreds of billions of data points. And I want you to combine that with the data that is collected by your MLS mm -hmm. on the market and every transaction that takes place. This is again, more billions, more data points. The data set we have right now is incredible. And the ability to take this data, sort through it and make predictions on one, which uh, neighborhoods, which homeowners are, are likely to produce sales, which, um, which people are likely to produce um, buyers. Our ability to be able to understand this behavior and predict the future is getting better and better literally by the minute. 2022 is going to be the year of predictive analytics. I'm convinced. Wow. Wow. That's great. So, so that makes me think of, um, I'm sure that they spent a lot of time on, on the conversation of the of social media and how it relates to yeah. specifically lead generation in real estate. And we've had a lot of conversations about this right now. And it seems, you know, like, you know, a year ago, we would say, oh, social media is, is you know, is, is a must. But it was kind of like a must, must, nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of must, right? Mm -hmm. Is it a must, must now? <laughs> I love the difference between must, must, and must, must, must. Uh, must yes, must, it must, is, must. It is, it is a must. And I'm going to tell you why. So, um, uh, I was at another event uh, in 2021, um, the National Association of Realtors annual conference and expo, sunny San Diego, California. I was really lucky to be uh, a speaker uh, at this year's event. Um, it was really great. Like, you know it's always great to go to San Diego, but great to hang out with, with 10,000 realtors who are all interested in pursuing their business. And I sat in uh, on a session by um, a gentleman named Kevin Tangan, and he was talking about marketing, specifically marketing funnels. And um, his uh, presentation, I took something really important away from his, his presentation. He talked about how social media is serving a new um, a new purpose within the funnel. Mm -hmm. And um, it was what he calls social discovery. And um, it used to be that the marketing funnel started with an interruption. So somebody is just doing their thing, marketing comes across their, their uh, radar, all of a sudden they're interrupted from what they're doing and they, they discover who you are. Then you would move to the influence stage. This is, you know, once you, once somebody discovers who you are, then you have to influence them to make a purchase with you. Then they'll have their experience and then they'll share that experience. So you're going to interrupt influence, buy or sell, and then share. Um, Kevin's suggestion though, was that there is now another stage in here, which is between interrupt and influence, there is social discovery where people are using social media 
to verify who you are, that you are who you say you are, that you do what you say you do, and that you know what you say you know. And that without this social level of discovery, your conversion rates are going to go into the tank because we have at our disposal tools to be able to verify our credentials, our expertise, our activity. And if people go to these tools and see nothing, see crickets mm -hmm. from you, they're going to think that you're a fraud, frankly. I know that sounds like a harsh thing to say, but think about it like this. If you have the chance to tell your story and you don't, then you are telling a story in your absence. And it's, I've got nothing to say. I've got nothing to back up my claims. I'm just a snake oil salesman who is trying to get you to take a flyer on somebody with no relatable or verifiable proof. That's just not going to fly anymore. Social you know, media is a must. I think it's such a great example because you, you know, today, everybody, all these products come out and they make these, you know, amazing claims, right? Call it, call it medication, you know, the latest, greatest medication, call it um, the new car, you know, the new technology. Like I just bought an electric snowblower, right? Like, wow. you know, the, my second one, I had a little one, but it wasn't powerful enough. So I bought literally the most expensive electric snowblower you can get on the market today. But you know how much social research I did before mm. I wrote that check? Mm. <laughs> well, I guess I didn't write a check, but before I clicked say. PayPal, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I probably had two, three hours of watching YouTube videos, mm. critique, and then I'd critique the, the reviewer of the video to see mm. if I trust that person. So imagine that's a, that's a $1,600 snowblower imagine when it's a $600,000 house. That's right? the truth. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, you're, we're trusting people. Uh, people are trusting us with the biggest financial decisions of their entire life. Yep. The, the least you could do is get a couple of reviews on Facebook and Zillow and, and have an active Instagram to make sure that people understand you're not just some fraud out there. And frankly, you know what, if you are a brand new agent, if you're listening to this and you're like, Oh shoot, I don't have any reviews. I don't have any, I don't have anything flashy I can post on Instagram. You're missing the point here, friend. And I, again, I don't mean this to sound harsh, but listen, if you're doing social media correctly, it is not about selling your services. It is about telling your story. Mm -hmm. It is about understanding um, who you are as a person and, and connecting the things that you do for people in the boardroom with the person that you are in their living room if mm -hmm. that makes any sense. So um, don't feel like social media isn't for you if you don't have these multi-million dollar sales to brag about. In fact, that's not what social media is all about. We want to use social media to verify who you are as a person, that you are who you say you are, that you do the things that you say that you do, um, and that you are, are the sort of person that somebody else wants to, wants to work with. It's not about bragging on your you know, um, incredible accolades. It's about verifying you as a human being. Mm, yeah. I think that's, I think that's very good and tangible advice, especially for those of us, like for me, I don't want to be seen online as a funny influencer and, you know, doing, doing things that, you know, just to gain eyeballs, right. Just to get attention. Um, I would much prefer to tell a story about a client, um, a way that we were able to solve the problem and overcome that. Um, and I do think that a good story replaces testimonials, right? It's, it's, totally. if you don't have testimonials, get a story. And if you don't have testimonials that are recent, um, get one from your previous, previous job, Absolutely. you know, Google doesn't 100%. filter your reviews, by the way, Google doesn't care if they were your past client, recent client, your mom, you know, you can have your mom review you on Google mm -hmm. and Google says, great, <laughs> five stars. <More> data. <laughs> That's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So look for 2022 to be a year where we can not only are we going to focus on conversion of our leads, 
Um, you know, what are we going to do to nurture these people down the funnel? Social media is a great way to do that, by the way, keep people engaged, people keep people, um, you know, with with you at the top of mind by continuing to stay active in their social feeds. It's going to be a year where we're using predictive analytics to make smarter lead generation decisions. We're only you we're using our data to only reach out to people who are the most likely buyers and sellers in your market. Um, it's it's the it's the moving away from the shotgun approach and moving towards the sniper rifle approach, and then last look at look at look at 2022 is the year of social discovery. If you're not using your social media platforms to serve that discovery and verification um, uh, uh, level within your funnel, your conversion rates are just going to suffer. You're you're going to be stuck in stuck in neutral most of the years, my guess. Well, Chris, that was outstanding. And I really appreciate your expertise and your knowledge. And I can't wait to have you back because I have so many more questions that I know you and I can dig deep on. Yeah. And thank you, everybody, with the Close Pro Weekly. Be sure to subscribe so you get each of these podcasts. And once again, Chris, thank you so much. Sean, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me on here. And uh, we're just getting started here. We're just getting started here. Just getting started. Okay. Bye-bye, folks.